one hi all uh welcome to theoretical hey. podcasting and i have with me today uh albert law hi albert hi <laughs> yes so albert's currently postdoc at uh, harvard um and um he he's gonna teach me what the uh, relation is between um scattering and uh, one loop determinants in the context of quantum field theory and curved space is that a fair way to put the the general point of today's discussion uh yeah i think it's fair yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah great great, great. So, I mean, the context in which we, I first got to know you was um, was through your work um, about like, well, having to do with De Sitter, which is also sort yeah. of like um, a large part of my research interest. And there too, it was a very sort of comprehensive and interesting paper you wrote with uh, several colleagues, both at Columbia, which is your alma mater, and... Um, uh, King's College and beyond about one loop determinants for yeah. fields of various, perhaps all spins <laughs> in, yeah. Yeah, on Dissiter backgrounds. All masses uh, too. <laughs> hey, right, right, right. Yeah. All masses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in that sense, very, very comprehensive. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is uh, similar questions, perhaps uh, perhaps to make it understandable, we'll, we'll stick to low spins, maybe <laughs> zero and a half, but yeah. um, similar, very similar context, a very similar kind of question in the black hole uh, context. Um, but I'm more curious about what got you thinking about this, these kinds of questions in general. Yeah, so, uh, well, I guess the starting point was, uh, as you said, the uh, somewhat long paper I wrote with uh, Dio, Frederick, and Zemo back in grad school. And actually shortly after that, I. Uh, you know, I was already thinking about, well, is there any, because there is a lot of curious observations in that paper. So at that point, I was already thinking, okay, yeah, are there any more general lessons that, you know, uh, that apply to more general scenarios? And expect, and, and also, you know, uh, people have been using you know, Eu Euclidean path integral for decades now, and we have amazing progress. Amazing, it's a very amazing tool. Uh, but, you know, a lot of basic aspects, I would say, is still um, under, you know, research. Uh, and, and this is just uh, one piece of it, but it looks like in the context of the sitter, um, we, we're confident we we're, we're doing the right thing, so yeah. So so at that point I was just thinking, okay, uh, are there more general lessons? And it turns out there are, and it actually, uh, yeah, work works beautifully uh, at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's how we got into this. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess what we should sort of uh, tease a little bit is that. You will provide us today a very nice uh, Lorentzian explanation for an otherwise mostly so Euclidean phenomenon, or at least what was thought of yeah. as a, an essential Euclidean phenomenon. This is sort of a very familiar exercise, um, which you know, depending on the version uh, of it you you use, it's, it it could go back to even like your first course in quantum field theory using the path yeah. integral, yeah, where you compute the vacuum energy um, contribution yeah. at one loop, and yeah. I mean, it's like one of those classic exercises where, you know, at least if you do everything on flat space, it's like you're effectively just doing this Gaussian integral and you discover that, well, just like how when you do multidimensional Gaussian integral, you compute for a bosonic uh, integral, one over the square root of a determinant of whatever the the quadratic form is that you have in your uh, Gaussian, or, you know, if it's fermionic, meaning you have some Grassmannian variables, you get the determinant to some positive power. Yeah. And... That sort of very um, innocuous calculation is hiding the fact that it, you're, you're doing this with a strict actual Gaussian, you know, this yeah. minus, right? Yeah. Whereas the question becomes in a different context or even, even maybe in that basic context, how, how to think about this uh, from a sort of intrinsically quantum mechanical perspective, which would require us to know about like some... Hilbert spaces, you know, like have a Lorentzian picture for it, right? Yeah. There's like some time and so on. 
So I guess we can set up that question um, in the context of um, black hole backgrounds, right? So, so this is sort of like the general uh, thrust of the, of the work here. Yeah, I guess uh, building up on what you said is like, well, basic quantum mechanics. Well, so um, I think I guess the thing about black hole is that is uh, we we sort of just generalize, uh, you know, uh, the the tools that we have and uh, just oh interpret that object, you know, uh, popping grow on a Julian background as some partition function, but uh, that interpretation is is. It's a, it's a gen, more like a generalization, you know, right. uh, rather than a derivation. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. yeah uh, so so that's well, that's why it, it caused a lot of confusions in the past, and it's never made clear, basically. Yeah. For sure, for sure, because indeed yeah. there's the whole history of uh, black hole thermodynamics that came from kind of blurring this distinction between whether we're talking about you know genuine Lorentzian black hole solutions or we're yeah. talking about these Euclidean cigar like yeah. uh, geometries, which uh, you know. Morally, there's some recrutation procedure to go between them, but you know the the, the actual picture is very different. Yeah. Anyway, for instance, exactly. in the basic phenomenon of uh, Hawking radiation, you can think of as uh, having come from looking at some actual definition of modes in this black hole geometry, near horizon modes, and some you know asymptotic yeah. modes, and then you figure figure out what the Bogolyubov coefficients are, or yeah. you just take the cigar, you know, define. <laughs> Define yeah. the partition function, evaluate it semi-classically, and then you know you infer what the temperature is. Yeah. And like okay, yeah. look, and you know they just tell you, yeah, yeah, these things are probably they they're probably related. There's probably yeah. a version of recrutation that makes sense on curved space, but then you think about yeah. it a little bit more, it's not true. Yeah, I so, think that's a very good way of. <laughs> so no, it's great yeah, to actually right, yeah. like here. I think this is yeah. really one of the first places where you can actually see the distinction. And what what I appreciate very much was that either in this paper or in the follow-up somewhere, you actually go back to the to that exact point of like, you know, using this procedure to give some meaning to some aspects of that Hawking calculation yeah. in the context of the original sort of asymptotically flat black holes too. Like where you actually talk about where you can get the the gray body factors in addition to yeah. like, you know, go back to that picture of like using yeah. the Weber coefficients and yeah. so on. So yeah. Yeah, I, I think yes. that that's yeah, that's really cool. So I guess we could we could proceed to yeah. set up the problem here yeah we can set up a problem uh so how do we start uh I'll just oh maybe oh how do i scroll up? <laughs> okay maybe like that all right yeah perfect yep so i guess um yeah we can just start here basically um yeah it's like what we said before the, the problem that the object we're interested in, uh, well, is this Euclidean popping grow on a black hole, Euclidean black hole background, a cigar, okay. Or the theory will be a sphere, right? Uh, so we're talking about, uh, you know, popping grow for quantum field theory uh, on this fixed background at one loop, which is typically uh, just computing some one loop determinant like that. Uh, and yeah, uh, we will focus almost exclusively on scalar in this discussion to make things simpler, even though we have some recent work on spinning fields. But yeah, we'll maybe we'll talk about that later. Um, so I guess, yeah, the question again is what is a Lorentzian calculation in terms of uh, Hilbert space, particles, et cetera, et cetera, that we produce this object? Okay. Um, so yeah, um, so a, a first thought would be that, right, because, well, we are looking at um, uh, a Euclidean geometry with some uh, thermal circle. You might think this object, this particle is really just computing some trace, E to minus beta H, like that. Um, and and uh, and this trace here is a trace over the fog space. Um, you know, uh, well, you build out of uh, yeah, on a time slice, and uh, this Hamiltonian is generate some time time flow, right? Um, yeah, so I guess yeah, maybe the Euclidean picture. Okay, will be some you know cigar shape like that, All right? And then the Lorentzian geometry will be uh, you know some outside horizon region, mm -hmm. uh, and this will be a time flow, right? 
so yeah. So okay, if we just uh, work with this object for the moment, okay, let's see what's going on. And uh, so if uh, well, if um, the spectrum for that Hamiltonian were discrete, then uh, this object is you know it's just elementary exercise. You can just compute that in this way, all right. Uh, you know, substituting more expansion and then some of occupation numbers. And yeah, this is what you see in your statmat class. All right. 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 Uh, and, and here uh, I'm just rewriting this equation into this way. Just take a log and, you know, rewrite in terms of density of states. All right. And here, yeah, this density is a single particle density of state. All right. Like that. Uh, okay. So, um, it was, yeah, if the spectrum of this Hamiltonian were discrete, but in reality it's not, it's uh, right. because of, you know, you have a horizon, you know, it's a infinite redshift surface. It can allow any real energies basically. So um, so all these expressions, they basically break down, right? Okay. Uh, and in particular, uh, this thing I'm writing here, it will be just strictly infinite, right? Because for any, small uh, intervals of energies, you have infinitely many modes. It's, there's a continuum of modes. So it's actually infinite. Right, right. right. Um, so in other words, um, this object right here, okay, just just completely, it's just completely ill-defined, right? Uh, and well, and, and as a result, it you know, these two just cannot be equal, you know, as it is. It just cannot, all right. Um, so that's, that's the basic problem, uh, we are facing here and, and the, um, you know, and the main point of this paper is to explain how, uh, you can modify the Lorentzian calculation a little bit. Okay. Well, how to make sense of it. Okay. Right. Uh, and eventually, you know, to connect, uh, it back to the Euclidean picture. So, so that's the, um. That's the main uh, problem of this paper. Mm -hmm. um, so here I'm, yeah, so here I'm just still commenting, uh, just commenting on the uh, connect, well, the hints from uh, the Dissiter case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so roughly speaking, it's really just, uh, we found a prescription to really make sense of the Lorentzian calculation and then, um, you know, reproducing the sphere path integrals, right? Uh, and yeah, and the paper, this paper right here is to uh, put that prescription on a more, you know, to justify that prescription or, you know, or actually explain what that prescription is actually doing, right? Um, right, so, I guess now maybe I should just jump into um, this part, maybe. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I guess. I guess. The, I mean, maybe you will, since there was some formula yeah. there involving these quasi-normal modes and so on. Yeah. You could briefly maybe, um, I don't know, motivate that formula. So, what do quasi-normal modes have to do with anything here? Because uh, <laughs> a priori, it just seems, uh, yeah. Um, how should I say? Uh, I guess the connection with quasi-normal mode, I, I guess, uh, well, it, it's partially what maybe here, what I'm trying to say here. Uh, so actually, you know, back in uh, 2009, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, these people, uh, yeah, uh, Frederick, Sean, and Sylvia, they, they actually derive a formula for uh, one of the determinants on Euclidean back poles, right? And, and in terms of quasi normal modes. Uh, right. So, right. Well, should I explain <laughs> the derivation here or no? Well, uh, yeah, you, you yeah. could sort of briefly mention, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess so I can sketch. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I can. I guess I can sketch the basic idea. Yeah. Uh, so, so the um, okay. First of all, um, uh, right. 
Right. Again, we are looking at the an object like this. All right. Uh, so first of all, we want to view um, this as a function in m square, right? Uh, and and try to match onto the zeros and poles of this function. So um, right, because that's right. all it has left to depend on. It's the only source in this. Yeah. In this so so calculation. Yeah. Um, right. So you see. Uh, oh, and here these like, determinants is like, you know, is a product over all eigenfunctions of this operator, all right? Uh, so, yes. So let me just say in a few sentences, it's like the idea is, uh, okay, if you take a quasi-normal, yeah, in the Lorentz architecture, and then you vary the mass, Okay, such that, um, such that, all right, so here Z is a quasi mole frequency, okay, which depend on the mass. Okay, as long as you vary the M square such that uh, this combination is equal to some positive integer, all right, sorry, negative integer, sorry. Uh, then that quasi normal mole. You know, once you weight rotate it in the Ewing signature, all right, it, it is it is, first of all, um is a regular mode. Okay. And second, it solves the equation of motion. It's just by definition, it solves yeah. the equation of motion because you know, sure, yeah. So that means that M, that value of M, right, he's a pole or zero uh -huh. of, of, of the uh, determinant, right? Right. So yeah. Determinant, right. Yeah. So anyway, so so that's how they got into uh, this form at the end, right? I see, I see, I see. Yeah. So so it basically comes from the fact that you know, well, uh, let's see if we can intuit this. I mean, basically, it's to say that you have this funny rational function. You expect that it has some. I expect that it's meromorphic. Just yeah, yeah. I guess and, that's a that's a that's an assumption. Yeah, that is an uh, assumption. That, that so. Assumption. Yeah. If it's meromorphic, then well, what do we need to know? We need to know it's like poles and zeros, yeah. and I mean, hopefully there are no zeros <laughs> unless this yeah. determinant sum blows up. So yeah. we need to know it's poles. So that would correspond to knowing where the equations of motion are, are satisfied yeah. because yeah. those are like the zero eigenvalues, and and then yes. you just you know figure it out from solving it in the sort of Lorentzian domain. And knowing that when you go to the Euclidean domain, you need to have regularity yes. at the tip of the cone. And yes. that's what this uh, 2.7 is in it, sort of captures. Yes. yes. And oh, that's how you get, yeah. Yeah, there, there's a typo here. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. Good. Ah, okay. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. So so that's the idea. Um, right. And, and here, I'm just rewriting it in a simple way. Yeah. Uh, oh, and here actually, okay, this formula eventually, you can rewrite this formula into this form. Right, right. It's just some kind of integral transformation you're doing. Yes. Some Laplace and, and, yeah. And uh, well, connecting to the earlier work in the city space, we basically observe the same formula. <laughs> mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, but there, the chi uh, is really you know, the uh, Harish Chandra character of mm -hmm, the visitor mm -hmm. group. But here I'm just throwing, yeah, actually that is yeah, in some sense equivalent to this earlier formula. I okay. see, I see. Yeah. Right. So so um, somehow in the sitter space, the sort of the, the various degeneracies of these quasi-normal modes are just related to characters of the Decider group in some Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some representation of the Decider group. There's some yeah. there's some direct relation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So That's so cool. um yeah. So in fact, okay, yeah, and uh, yeah, you're asking me, uh, asking me about uh, Cosino mode, how, how, yeah, how uh, it came in the story. In in fact, uh, you know, this observation was, uh, the opposite uh, observation that, you know, allow us to to uh, try to, you know, make more progress in into this problem. Right? Otherwise, you know, I, I there's no well, I would not have guessed the entire thing. Uh, but here is like okay after rewriting oh we actually see the same formula for general 
static black holes at least. So um, yeah, that. And then we started thinking about it deeply, like uh, how how is how it is connected to a density of space, things like that. Um, but but I would say at that point, yeah, at, at, at the point, um, you know, DHS derived this formula. They, you you know, their derivation was entirely a Euclidean perspective, right? Uh, well, they they. They make connection with quasi normal modes, but they didn't elaborate on, uh, you know, Hilbert space, density of states, things like that. So yeah, and and this paper is aiming to do that. Okay. Um. So should are we are we good now? Like yes, the, uh, yes. Yeah. We can proceed. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. Uh. Okay. Let's get to the main point. Uh. So now. We'll just go to the Lorentzian nature. Is it complete Lorentzian uh, consideration in the following? Um, again, let's just consider a massive scalar, a free massive scalar on a uh, Lorentzian black hole background. Okay, and and uh, and actually, uh, for the sake of concreteness, let's just focus on Azetoli ADS. Uh, the same sorry apply for this either, but right. Uh, that means we are looking at the. Uh, you know, geometry like that, all right? Okay. Uh, all right. So, um, yeah, the starting point uh, is to first of all we, you know, do this separation of variable simple. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we rewrite the uh, klein gordon equation. Okay. Uh, into you know into this form, all right? Uh. So it's essentially for each L is a one disjoint problem with some potential, right? And and here uh, I've written in terms of a total coordinate, right? So yeah, okay, good picture. Um, so I've chose yeah. Uh, so here uh, x is zero at uh, the spatial infinity, okay, and x is minus infinity at the horizon. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, so, so here, basically, yeah. we're describing some scattering problem off of the off of the horizon, effectively. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's um, sort of what it ends up being per per angular momentum mode. Yes, yes, that's yes. One such yes. problem. That's the idea. Yes, that's the idea. Uh, yeah, I, I guess this type of scattering problem is not familiar to everyone. So let, let me emphasize right, again. Yeah, break the asymptote. Yeah, this asymptotic region is at the horizon, right? Uh, so here, um. In this picture, right, we're basically doing this. Okay, sending waves from the horizon, and then uh, it does some stuff, and then going back. All right, is that all right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and here um, we have this effective one D scattering problem. Again, the horizon. Is at uh, minus infinity, and uh, mm -hmm. this is spa spatial infinity. Spatial infinity. All right. Yeah. So we have some incoming wave and outgoing waves. That's it. All right. Uh, All right. So, so this is a little bit reversed from the um, conventions, I guess you would see in like uh, I don't know derivation of Hawking radiation or something. Usually, you would have in and out <laughs> labeled in the opposite way. But yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, probably. <laughs> Yeah, and, and also I guess I guess uh it's also somewhat an opposite terminology from uh, these you know quasi-normal papers. Uh I mean, but here when I say in and now I'm I'm you know I, I'm referring to uh, you know towards and right away from the horizon and into the horizon. I would mean like into the horizon. <laughs> yeah, I know it, it can be confusing, but uh, right, from right. from from the perspective of this one D problem, I think is a more natural terminology. Um, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. indeed. So yeah, yeah I, I guess the point is, it depends on your perspective, right? And if if your yeah. perspective is the um, asymptotic observer, yeah, then well, what would your yeah, what would you think? Would be the out region would be the horizon, right? So it's yeah. like somewhere out yeah. there, and the potential yeah. scattering setup would make more sense from that perspective. Otherwise, yeah. 
I don't know. It's it's weird. Yeah. It's doable. It's just yeah. weird. But... Yeah. Uh, anyway, but this is the the terminology I will use. Uh, right. So. Um, oh yeah, and uh, okay, just a bit of detail. Uh, for entity ADS spaces, um, the general solution to this equation of motion uh, at infinity is. Uh, as we all know, is a non linear combination of a normalizable mode and normalizable modes. Um, so uh, imposing standard boundary condition, we're just killing this piece. Right here, I'm just trying to define normal what what we mean by normal modes. Okay, uh, and, and that's uh, and setting this to zero uniquely pick out one. Right. Uh, anyway, so um, near horizon. Right. Uh, that means you know in this asymptotic region we have a linear combination of plane waves, right? Uh, because you know the potential is basically flat, right? So it's linear combination of plane waves, um, and uh, and here the important point is um, right. These coefficients, they're complex conjugate of each other. It's easy to show because because if you just take um, the complex conjugate of uh, of this solution, it solves the same equation. So um, yeah, it's a conventional equation of each other. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, this ratio of ingoing and in, well, outgoing and ingoing coefficients is a pure phase, right? Uh, yes. And right here, I'm just rewriting this asymptotic behavior in terms of uh, this phase shift, all right? Uh, so, uh, going back to the beginning, right? Uh, we, right at the beginning, I mentioned because, uh, well, actually, here the omega. Uh, for every omega, okay, you have a unique solution, and they are all good modes to consider, right? They are your normal modes. So, um. You know, the density of states, the, only, the density of these modes is just infinite for any omega, right? Uh, so if you try to compute, you know, trace e minus beta h, uh, you know, the, the, that object will be ill defined, right? Um, but to see, okay, and here I'm just explaining how to see that more explicitly. So uh, I guess, right. Um, if we cut off the scattering problem, if some at some large distance, right, uh, you can so, actually so yeah. just to clarify that. Yes. Where would this cutoff be from the perspective of the scattering problem? Would it be near the horizon that you're? Yeah, near to? horizon. So right. so very large negative distance. I see. So it's like some some kind of stretched horizon type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's basically uh this this picture. Yeah. This picture showing here. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Great. But ultimately, we want to remove that because it's not really there, right? Um, right, but here, okay, just as an inter intermediate step, right? We put it there and, you know, see how everything works up precisely. So, uh, yeah, we put a cutoff here. It's a brick wall cutoff. And then... Uh, well, you can impose, you know, uh, Dirichlet boundary condition. Actually, it turns out it does not matter what you put there. Anything you put there will will, will be good. But you know, for concreteness, we can just set it to a, set the field to be constant there. Okay, doing that, you can actually solve the spectrum. Okay, um, like this. Okay, and with this, uh, you can actually compute the smooth out density of states. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, here it uh is really just one over for the spacing of uh, the energy. Um. Right. So so here you see okay. Um. Oh, in large R. All right. 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 So first of all, you have this leading term. Okay. R over pi R is the size of uh the box. Yeah. R is a cutoff parameter. And you have this subleading term uh, depending on this uh, phase shift. So, so here, okay, now it is the uh, key conceptual point, right? First of all, 
okay, because of this leading term, right? This thing goes to infinity as you take R goes to infinity, right? But at the same time, if you think about it, that term uh, is sort of meaningless because as, you know, purely from the point of view of, um, of the scattering problem, right? Uh, you know, as long as you have some localized potential uh, contained in the box of size R, right? You will have that term, okay? So, so that term does not tell you anything at all about the potential. Right, right. right. It's just setting some characteristic yeah, minimum yes. frequency or something like that. Yes. And if you're taking yeah. one over that, then of course it'll appear as the leading. Yeah. Leading. So yeah. Yeah. So 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 in this sense, it's a, it, it's sort of meaningless. It tells you nothing about the the shape of the potential. Right. Uh, versus, you know, this sub leading term. Okay. Uh, the uh, the term depending on the phase shift. Uh, you know, this phase shift does depend on the shape of the potential. You know, in this context, it, that means uh, it depends on the black hole geometry, depends on uh, the mass of a, a scalar and the angular momentum. All right. So, so all the interesting information is hidden here. Okay. Um, right. And then, okay, uh, so, 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 so the thing is, you know, how, what do we do to extract that piece? Um, you know, ultimately we want to remove, we want to send out all the way to infinity, but at the same time, we want to retain the useful information encoded in this phase sheet, right? Uh, so, um, right, and, and then yeah, this is the, uh, sort of, uh, the conceptual point is, uh, you know, it's a wisdom borrow, you know, from condensed matter people, right? Right. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, they, they're all, they're also interested in the scattering, you know, uh, open systems, right? And, and uh, I guess, yeah, and, and they also face this problem of, you know, infinite uh, density of states. Uh, but very often what they're interested in, for example, you know, you have a piece of material, you, you have some material, okay. Uh, and then they, you know, they're interested in the, the effect of having it some sort of defect or not, right? So, you know, the, the for them, the interesting quantity is the difference, you know, like they, they're interested in the um, changes in, you know, free energies due to the presence of uh, some defect, for example. Right, right. Right. Um, so here that's like some impurity or something like that. There. Yeah, 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 impurity, yeah. Um, so here, okay, uh, after a little bit of thought, you can actually completely borrow that wisdom. Well, but but that is right, really like, you know, comparing different scattering problems, right? Right. Um, uh, so here we are trying to do the same. So, okay, instead of just focusing on this thing here, okay, we compare uh, two scattering problems, right? Um, but of course, uh, that's a question of uh, what is the reference you're comparing to, but we'll go back to that later. But the thing is, okay, you can you can just come, for example, you can just consider the scattering problem with zero potential, right? Then the spectrum will be like flat, okay? It's a uniform spectrum. Or something else, any, any, you know, or something crazy, you know, like that, as long as it's some, you know, localized, you know, uh, potential, right? Then you, that will, that will do the job. But, okay, uh, whatever you do, uh, whatever reference problem you choose, you can compute some reference density of state like that, right? And the point is, okay, once you take the difference, right, you can uh, take R goes to infinity without any trouble. You know, you have a completely finite quantity like that, okay? And the result will be in terms of the phase shifts, all right? Uh, and, and, right. Uh, and uh, notice that the comment, okay, if you look at this relation here, uh, the answer, you know, the right hand side only depends on the phase shifts, right? And the phase shifts only depends on the asymptotic behavior of, of the, waves, you know, near infinity. Right. 
in other words, uh, remember what we said about boundary condition. Mm -hmm. uh, so here, okay, it, it's clear that you know this relation does not depend on what you pick. Yes, at, at that brick wall, right? Uh, because it only depends on asymptotics, not the exact value of the field. Uh, so yeah, it's a completely unambiguous, you know, good quantity to consider. Um, good. So, yes. So I guess the main point is, okay, going back to this original calculation. Okay, this is, uh, this is what uh, was our starting point, which we already saw is ill-defined because uh, this density of state is just infinite by itself, right? Right. Uh, but, uh, well, motivated by our discussion just now, uh, the proposal here is that we should actually consider differences in free energy. Um, and uh, this thing here is completely well-defined. Um, yeah, so that's the idea. So that's the key idea. Great, um, great. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, of course. Okay, <laughs> well, uh, there's still a question of uh, what 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 we pick there. Okay, uh, but but at least you know from this entire uh, Lorentzian perspective, um, the point is that there is no, there is actually no canonical choice for for that reference. A any any reference would do. Okay, right. So so that means you have an infinite you know family of good quantity. Of course, the module, you know, the usual, uh, you know, UV divergences, things like that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, the module that you have infinitely many good quantities to consider, right? Um, so yeah, so what, what do we do? Okay. And um, I guess uh, another key observation in this paper is that, all right, so, okay. Uh, if we compare this quantity with uh, the Euclidean path integral, right? Uh, well, then uh, we observe uh, from you know working out all these examples uh, that actually picks out some unique answer, right? Uh, but mm, Oh, but actually, uh, before I got to that, let me comment on the quasinomial modes. All right, uh, here. Um, okay. Yeah, maybe let me get to this. Okay, so so here, um, this. This is essentially the same relation we saw earlier, okay? But uh, here I'm rewriting it in terms of the S matrix, which is, again, the ratio between the outgoing and ingoing coefficients. Right, right. Right. It directly related to the phase shift. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The log of it is a phase shift, basically. Uh, so the, yeah, the connection of the modes is, uh, is that, all right, um, Quasi-normal modes, um, right? They satisfy purely outgoing boundary conditions. By outgoing, I, I mean going into the horizon. Into the horizon, right? Right. So yeah. So way. that means right. yeah, their locations, right? Quasi-normal mode frequencies. Uh, they are the locations where the in yeah, probably coefficient. want to scroll down a little bit yeah because oh, <laughs> it's a right. bit on the margin sure sure yeah yeah i sorry. see okay yeah so and you see uh for all these frequencies it will hit a pole of this function yep uh you know so so that i'm just saying that's how you see the oh, i see i see that's what they come about i see yeah 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 so so oh, in other words quasi normal most they are basically scattering poles Mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. of the scattering problem. You know, they're the resonances. Yeah. Um, anyway, so 
um, that's how you see there might be a connection with DHS formula, you know, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, anyway, so, okay. Uh, yeah, going back to the connection with the Euclidean picture, the key observation uh, in this paper is that, well, working out all these examples, okay, uh, we found that um, the reference problem should be the one on the winner like space. I see. Yeah. So in um, other words, you're saying that if you try to interpret the result of the Euclidean path integral as a ratio. Yeah, exactly. Between the prescribed potential that's just coming from looking at this, like what you set up, you know, like yeah. you just go look at the separation of variables, set up this 1D scattering problem, and you know that, okay, it's not divergent, it has to be something finite, and therefore there's a ratio, then the denominator is essentially fixed by trying to compare with the regulated Euclidean bulk result, like a Euclidean result, because you know yes. what Euclidean result is. Yes. And what you're finding then is that the reference system that the Euclidean calculation picks for you is this Rindler. Rindler yes. System. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, even even now, I, I still think it's kind of uh, uh, how to say, it, it's still kind of magical, you know, it, because it, I, I mean, or, at least right now, I still don't have any first principle understanding of what's going on, why it breaks out winner, things like that. But you know, all the examples that we, uh we check, it, it works out. Uh, and actually, you know, the story or generalize the higher spin, things like that. Yeah, it's always a case um, you choose um, the render as reference, you know. Um, well, yeah, it looks something that's correct. So, <laughs> so it's see. kind of a miracle. Um, so like in all the cases that you've actually computed that this procedure works with the Rindler uh, space being the reference. Yeah, yes, yes. Mm. Uh, even though, uh, in which respect, it's not completely crazy to consider, but yeah, uh, but here, okay, maybe, maybe let me elaborate a little bit. Oh, all right. Uh, by uh, Rindler uh, like region, I mean this. Uh, so, okay, if we take uh, geometric and then go to near horizon region, you always have, you know, this Rindler like. Um, metric okay uh and the scattering problem okay uh again you separate variables and then uh, for each l you have this uh swinger problem uh with an exponential uh potential right so there uh you can just it's it's very easy to solve this problem and uh the solution they are just um basically uh Bessel functions mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and and you can yeah and then the horizon is a linear combination of plane waves and then take the ratio you'll get this ratio of gamma functions mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right uh so that's the s, s matrix um, i see yeah so um So here, just to be concrete, let, let, maybe let's just look at an example and then the, it will become clear, right? Uh, here, I'm just uh, considering um, scalar on static PTC and uh, solving the equation of motion um, on this space. Ex uh, exactly, you can uh, find you know, the uh, these ingoing outgoing coefficients, all right? So first of all, uh, yeah, and so uh, if you take the ratios, okay, then you'll find two parts. First of all, you have this uh, SPTC, right? For anyone who are familiar with uh, cosinal modes on PTC, okay, the poles and zeros of this part, they're basically a location of, you know, cosinal modes on PTC, right? Uh, and, and there is a second piece, Okay, which is still to this gamma function here. Okay. Uh yeah, is this well, remember we saw earlier, you know, uh on the arena space, 
the S matrix is a ratio gamma functions. That's what we see here. Okay. Right, so, so it's like it naturally factorizes already. Yeah, it's a natural factorization. So that means if you choose the Rina as a reference, right, then you only um you know, capture contributions from this part, SBDC part. And in fact, if you just compute that thing, um, um you're know, using this to compute Bayesian function, things like that, you you recover uh the result well known in literature. So here, yeah, it's basically this. Okay. Right, right. Uh and and your know, people in the past computed one of the determinant on BTC before. Uh on, on Euclidean BTC. And here we're basically reproducing that uh from this Lorentzian perspective. Okay. Very cool. Uh, yeah. So here, similarly, uh, yeah, we work out another example on Narii. It's the same thing. Uh, again, uh, you know, in your S matrix, you always have this curious winner piece. Uh, so once again, it uh, works out. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, these are main results in this paper. Right, right, yeah. yeah this and is here, a... yeah. Uh, and here I'm just uh, making trying to make a connection with uh, asymptotically flat space, right? Uh, because uh, in asymptotically flat space, uh, the scaring problems are somewhat different. Um, but in the case of B, uh, in the case of asymptotic ADS, you know, you have this, um, you know. From the horizon out of the horizon, uh, the sitter is the same, uh, but in flat space you you can have another asymptotic region, right? At infinity, right? You can send waves from the infinity or from the horizon. So in other words, is is actually a two channel scattering problem instead of one channel. Right. Uh, so yeah, the S matrix there, uh, you know, is a two by two matrix. Okay, as uh, is being shown here. Okay. Uh, yeah. So like. So I guess. Right. Schematically, the. Uh, right, you can send waves from the from the horizon or from the infinity, and then going back, right, like that. Um. <clears throat> So, and here, um, right, yeah, the wave at um, spatial infinity and near horizon, they are all in a combination of plane waves, okay, being shown here. And the S matrix, you can define that as, you know, a matrix that maps these ingoing coefficients to outgoing coefficients. And here, uh, I defines you know this reflection and transmission coefficients, okay. And well, uh, and similar to um, the ADS case, you you know you you can deduce these unitarity conditions, right? Uh, yeah. So the observation here is uh, that all right. Um, this relation is the generalization of what we saw earlier. Okay. Um, You're just taking the trace in addition. Yeah, then a trace, then a trace. Uh, yeah, or take the determinant, the determinant of the, Sure, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, the same thing. Um, so the observation here is really that, okay, if you, uh, if you calculate, yeah, trace log S, all right, um, that thing is essentially the phase of the transmission coefficient. And uh, that actually, that's, uh, actually makes a good, you know, nice connection with uh, another quantity uh, of interest, which is a gray body factor. The right. gray body factor is essentially the magnitude of the transmission coefficient. Uh, and here, uh, the observation is, uh, is just that um, the, the phase of the transmission coefficient uh, is also, is actually something meaningful, is actually related it actually captures uh, the uh, spectral density mm -hmm. uh, of 
you know, of this scalar, uh, of the Hamiltonian, you know, for the scalar theory. Right, right, right. right. Um, so, yeah. So these are the main points of the, this paper. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Right. And so I guess the, you have to mention that you do have follow-up results so also about the spinning fields. And there, I guess it's a whole other discussion we can go into about edge modes and all those other subtleties. Yeah. But I mean, for now, this, this is a great um, uh, and very lucid explanation we've uh, heard from you about how we can relate these two um, pictures, that is the scattering picture, which again is, a, you know, it's like if you go back to the original Hawking calculation, like these two elements are already there. There yeah. was, the, this is a picture in which he derived his original result, like the one that you have here. The scattering perspective, while on the other hand, there's the Euclidean calculation, which is kind of disembodied from all of this, and that that also gives you allegedly the same result. And here we're seeing a little bit more why these things are related, and why it seems like this this Rindler piece is like a, I don't know some universal source of a divergence in the naive in the count yeah. of the number of states, you know, the density of states, and so on. That's very fascinating, and you know what this reminds me of is. Um, a whole branch of literature, which I'm sure you might have encountered, which relates um, quasi-normal modes to the so-called thermodynamic BT ansatz. Have you heard of this stuff? Like in I heard of it, but I uh, I have to admit I haven't looked into those in detail. Yeah, I mean the the very funny thing is that you know that there's all these uh, the words people use like. Um, cyber and quasi-normal mode connection and so forth. I mean, if you, I could briefly maybe um, show you uh, some references that I found uh, about this topic, which, <laughs> I mean, it might it might connect to the same thing or not. Um, so just a second. Okay, should I stop sharing? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'll, um, yeah. yeah just... So here is an example. So this is like... <laughs> says a new method, which probably means it's one of the first. Uh, but I mean, I, I should apologize. I'm not completely up to date about this literature. This might not be the very first article about this topic. Indeed, it's yeah. from this year, so I suspect it very much might not be. But anyway, the point is that they talk about the so-called ODEIM correspondence. I'm not going to go into any details because some of this is well above my pay grade. Um, but the basic idea is one takes... Um, you know, this problem of, of finding this, these Ronskians and then turns it into this so-called Y system. You know, you define this function Q and then you define this function Y. And then with it, you know, this, this Y system is um, uh, basically a gadget in integrability literature that one uses uh, to then figure out all kinds of other things about the system, you know, like all kinds of other features, you know, for instance, eventually, <laughs> just sort of like <laughs> they themselves acknowledge that there's many steps in the story. <laughs> yeah. They solve it via so-called thermodynamic beta ansatz, nonlinear integral equation that determines so-called pseudo energies um, of, of this model through which we can infer what the scattering um, matrices are, the S matrices are. But, Basically, what I should say is that in all of this uh, stuff, right, in, in this entire story, the, the usual starting point for it is two to two elastic scattering, which is, right. again, from the spatial perspective, 1D, but instead of potential yeah. scattering, it's elastic scattering. And because it's elastic scattering, again, the S matrix is just a phase shift. It's a phase shift depending only on sort of the difference of rapidities. And what one does is uh, basically exploits the fact of, you know, unitarity, crossing symmetry, et cetera, yeah. to, you know, constrain the form of this phase shift. You know, there's like a bootstrap program to determine it, or one uses more powerful tools like these beta and such related techniques to actually determine either, you know, the spectrum of the theory, the energy spectrum on a cylinder based off of this phase shift information, which is, you know, you relate these large volume asymptotic uh, quantities like the S matrices to... Yeah. Uh, finite cylinder quantities like you know where, where one direction is really compact like if you have a cylinder then you have energy levels and um what they're saying here is that you can cast the problem of finding quasi-normal modes to some similar exercise you know and use this, this thermodynamic when you use this thermodynamic beta ansatz 
and you see there's like intuition that came from doing the the classic n equals to su2 pure uh, gauge theory and some funny backgrounds so it's like all this cyber written stuff that is right. where some of the intuition came from but ultimately it seems like there's some uh there's some wisdom here also in using the scattering problem thing very seriously i guess what you've done is actually pointed out that in addition to just determining the quasi-normal mode frequencies themselves, you can actually use that to then determine, for instance, the density of states and other related yeah. quantities in, in these actual black hole backgrounds. And I'd be very curious if that has any meaning. Like, I'm, I'm just very curious if that has any meaning in this kind of language, uh, which again, there's a lot of literature about this. I mean, um, I can yeah, add I, I, yeah. in... Yeah, I could bring you and send you, but like, just there's, there's a lot of literature which some yeah, of which are more accessible yeah. than others. But yeah, it's a very interesting. Um, yeah, there are a lot of. Uh, yeah, you may also know that there have been a lot of uh, interesting progress on, like, the you know calculating quasi normal modes on even just like queer background, for example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like uh, the, the the example they're using there is these D three brains. And I'd yeah. be curious if you've looked into any of these planar type solutions, like those those brain solutions, where you, I mean, it would be interesting to see if even there the reference system that you need to subtract is like yeah. This. yeah 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 that, that, yeah yeah that'll be uh, interesting to see yeah 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 there are a lot of uh, you know open questions for example right. yeah like you know I I I'm. First of all, I personally want to uh, explore, you know, how, you know, how things generalize to interacting theories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, we've been doing just free fields, but but there must be some more general uh, way of uh, viewing all of this without working out all of these examples. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's something that I want, I want to ex explore. Right. I mean, the I guess the point still is that sure uh, if you're going to compute a one loop determinant, yeah, the well, if it's if you're doing weak coupling perturbation theory, that's always going to be a free calculation, right? I mean, in weak coupling, yeah, like the one loop determinants are always just the free part, um, because it's order h bar, and then you know, like not everything else kind of drops out. Uh, what might be interesting is if you have some complicated system, like some strongly coupled system, where there are other methods, you know, if you're talking about something like the sphere partition function, then you see like sphere partition function, like, you know, there's this whole literature in supersymmetric gauge theories to compute those objects using localization. Yeah. And you see there, it's it really matters that you go to certain geometries, it seems. I don't know how, how true this is, but most of the calculations I've seen people do are like on sphere, on whatever, you know, like typically some some geometry sphere comes up very often, right? Which is a Dissider calculation, yeah. right? I mean, ultimately. And there, um, it would be very interesting if you could take those localizers. Those localization gives you like a sort of a matrix integral representation of this quantum field theory partition function at strong coupling, right? It's not even like, uh, so it's, you can get one over and resummed result, right? So I'd be very curious if, if you had such a result, right, at ha in hand, right? Whether there's any representation in terms of this uh, quasi normals or anything Lorentzian, mm -hmm. because, you know, usually how people do this localization calculation is in some purely Euclidean setting. And then, you know, yeah. you do this and you, I mean, there's, Again, like you guys have touched on this a little bit because yeah. you have that result of uh, you know the resummation of all the higher spins in Trent Simons looks like yeah. a, like this topological string partition function or something. But like, if you took some, I don't know, uh, TDN equals four or even just ABGM or something like that. I'm saying just yeah. it's actually a very complicated theory. But there, where they have these ex explicit examples of uh, one over n resummed sort of uh, sphere partition function, strong coupling. Yeah, it's not an obvious determinant formula anymore. It's something, right? And the reason why it has that shape has to do with some special features of the particular theory. But no nonetheless, if you have an example like that, is there some Lorentzian picture? I wonder, like with this understanding that you have right now, I wonder if there's a way of saying like, I mean, at least at the level of some change of basis type argument, can you obtain some... <laughs> Some representation. It might not just be a simple mode count. It might involve some some crazy functions. Mm -hmm. But 
Um, that would be one, I guess, uh, tough challenge, but also would give yeah. you some very interesting insight into putting these kinds of quantum field theories on the actual Lorentzian Sitter background. If, if that yeah, I think that's a very interesting question, and yeah, we we should think about it. Like definitely, yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it's kind of funny. We we always, well, actual calculation. We we always almost always uh, work in the Euclidean nature. But uh, yeah. when you try to interpret the answer, you yes. want to interpret that in terms of Hilbert space, things like that, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, that it, yeah, I, well, I think, well, it's uh, even as a matter of, you know, understanding basic principles, that, that, that should be a way of understanding those directly in the Lorenzis nature. Exactly, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so you know what? Uh, let me show you another nice reference, which is yeah. a very um. This is a little, little bit more accessible than what I showed you before, yeah. with all due respect to those authors. But these are lecture notes. So, so this is the Marino's lecture notes on localization uh, and matrix models in supersymmetric and Simon's matter theories, and here he goes through, like you know, let's just look here. He sort of lays out what the the theory of interest is. It's this supersymmetric and Simon's matter theory, and then there's this ABJM theory, which is sort of the culmination of it. This is a somewhat intricate construction, but ultimately it's a theory of some, well, you know, concretely, what is it? It's a theory of some vectors, some um, scalars, and some fermions, right? Ultimately, that's what it'll boil down to. Yeah. And that float goes into this section three, where he does basically one loop calculation of the sphere uh, partition function. And yeah. that's nothing but the calculation you showed, accounting for the various particle species and the spins. That's all, you know, just just adding together all those. And then, you know, from that, you compute the free energy. So, okay, you see, you put it on S3, and then you take all the matter fields together, and then you get this ABGM recoupling result, which is literally just a sum of all of those contributions, right? It would be interesting because even there, you could probably go and then recast that in terms of this Lorentzian calculation already, because it's yeah. all particle species that you already know how to deal with. Right, I mean, it's already yeah. there in your in your uh, paper somewhere. Yeah. And what he says is, okay, no, look at the strong coupling result by doing ADS CFD. Okay, so you see in ADS, so basically what you can do is uh, compute this free energy in ADS four. You take the with the strong coupling, you expect that there's an ADS four dual, and then you can use sort of like holographic normalization techniques to work out what the strong coupling limit of this kind of object should be. Then he says, okay, there's this localization result that just gives you this full one over n sum result, you know, it's basically compute the exact uh, exact answer and you can just, uh, you know, go to both <laughs> both limits and see that it's kind of working. You see, you get these exact interpolating functions. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, so, so that's the structure in which he's laid this out. But the fact of the matter is that there might be something interesting to even do at this level where, you know, you have some known theory that has... Uh, some sphere and partition function. Yeah. By just doing a gravity calculation in the bulk, right? So now we're talking about quantum. So we're talking about two different things. We're talking about like strong coupling quantum field theory on S, uh, say S3, can be calculated by looking at the ADS Euclidean ADS5 gravity action on shell with that boundary condition. Right, with the with the S3 boundary, right? sorry, ADS4, not ADS4, ADS4, with the S3 boundary condition. And that gives you some answer, right? Again, how do you get that? Like, is it, okay, even, okay, so forget about intermediate coupling, whatever, just even a strong coupling. Is there some sense in which we have some intuition of writing that as some, you know, as some Lorentzian thing? Hmm. That'd be very interesting because again, it'll tell us a little bit about like even in holography, what's what's the kind of relation. Yeah. And then of course, you know, if you have some very nice setup like what they have here, then okay, you can go like let's see, you have some answer. Let's go to page fifty-eight. Uh, <laughs> hmm. uh, okay. So anyway, there there's some expressions in the middle that we saw there that look sort of similar, but anyway, they have some some functions here that that do everything. So whatever you know um so so these are the kinds of things that um yeah i guess you could aim at which would be very interesting because as you said there are different techniques to sort of capture interacting strong coupling dynamics including ads cft and whatever 
but you're right that always there's just um, a calculation done in Euclidean signature and a story told in Lorentzian signature and sometimes they meet other times there's just a story in the Lorentzian case there's no there's no picture <laughs> yeah 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 and and also maybe another comment is uh somewhat unrelated um you know the, the connection with this uh um phenomenon algebra story yes 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 uh so of course we are using very different languages here uh but ultimately we are trying to answer you know same questions basically how to make sense of traces um you know in what sense you know some entropy is entropy you know things like that uh so yeah it's definitely uh interesting to try to uh make a connection between uh, these approaches uh you know, they 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 they're trying to make sense of the issue by you know the formal language of formal algebras versus here is uh just looking very hard at the your know, field theory uh, so that is uh, another interesting thing to uh, pursue yeah absolutely like that bonhomme algebra notion is sort of formalizing this idea that people have had for a long time or it is actually yeah. one of the things that motivated understanding quantum field uh, entanglement entropy in quantum field theories to begin with it all yeah. started with Raphael Sorkin who was trying to understand the Hawking calculation and see if somehow you could get this Hawking calculation to come out of an entanglement entropy calculation of a quantum field theory. So this is a funny history. And what he found was it almost happens. The problem is in place of where the Planck length should be, you get the cutoff. You know, if you did this as a quantum field theory calculation, and this is like a well-known fact that, you know, if you have an area law entanglement entropy, then indeed, you know, it's as if you have the same kind of... Um, same kind of cutoff, you know, it's like as if the cutoff appears in the same place. If you pretended like the Planck length was your yeah. cutoff for the for the black hole case. And then it was understood that actually, you know, the entanglement entropy of matter fields contributes to the black hole entropy by renormalizing the Newton's constant. Yeah. And the, 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 its cutoff can sort of be absorbed into a redefinition of the Newton's constant. And all that is very nice. But you see, none of this actually goes to the bottom of the effect that gravity has of putting the Planck length in place of where you would have expected cutoff for pure pure quantum field theory calculation, right? Like, you know, coupling to gravity seems to give you this natural Planck scale type regulator in place of where you would have expected to see cutoff, just the UV cutoff of the quantum field theory mm -hmm. appearing, which is an arbitrary high scale. It, yeah. It's unclear what it should be. It is very context dependent. Whereas the Planck scale is just, it's just a Planck scale. The G Newton is just G Newton. It appears where it appears. And that's sort of like the underlying sort of regulating effect that needs to be clarified, right? You know, why does that happen? And yeah. I guess that's that's sort of the, the von Neumann algebra, the, the type changing, right? That's what it manifests as, and a yeah. type going from three to two, or, and, you know, like so all these sorts of things, which, um, yeah, it's very exciting that now we have, like, different corners to try to, like, yeah. put our finger on that. On that yes, hold on. Yes. Yeah, it would be great to even, yeah, talk about that specifically at some point but i mean anyway this is, this is very interesting uh yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you very much and uh, i mean yeah, i look no forward problem. to yeah. more discussions uh yeah thank you for inviting me <laughs> of course <laughs> yeah uh yeah. good good, so good, if, good if you've gotten this far um please feel free to like subscribe comment and share this is directly podcasting and i will catch you next week